Hello, my name is Roar Sandegaard. I'm a senior scientist at the Technical University of Denmark at the Department of Energy Conversion and Storage. Um, and here, among other things, we deal with the manufacture, upscaling and installation of organic solar cells. Uh, the organic solar cell technology has evolved around the prospect of low cost, uh, fast manufacturing of large area because of solution processing uh, on thin outlines, flexible substrates uh, using low temperatures which also of course means low embodied energies if the right materials are used. Um, because of the organic materials can be modified this of course means that there's a huge material selection available uh, and the solar cell can be tuned in many ways. At this time, uh, lifetimes and deficiency, especially, uh, are still challenges that need to be, be dealt with. Traditionally, the organic solar cell is prepared in the laboratory uh, on a size below one square centimeter, sometimes very much below. Uh, the substrate is typically a glass substrate with indium tinoxide, ITO, and uh, spin coating uh, is used for uh, the preparation of the different films. This means waste, so to speak, but it makes very nice films. Uh, the small scale uh, devices are also uh, use evaporation for electrodes and the manufacturer is typically uh, prepared in a glove box or in a controlled atmosphere. All these circumstances uh, have done that the technology have now uh, surpassed the, the threshold of the famous 10%. Uh, that for many people has been uh, where the technology uh, could prove its worth. Um, this of course is very interesting materials wise but on uh, a technology scale uh, it's problematic that many of the processes used in the laboratory uh, cannot be directly transferred uh, to larger scale. It's, it's not scalable processes. For example, the, uh, the spin coating. If we go to large scale, we're talking size-wise square centimeters to square meters. Uh, we're talking processing of kilometers of foil. Uh, and here at DTU, we've had a, a main emphasis on trying to reduce all the factors that we would, at a later stage, would have to discard because of cost or stability. Uh, and this of course means that sometimes the devices don't perform quite as well, but um, it is what is needed to drive the research towards manufacture. Uh, some of the things that are required to do so uh, are to think about material use, uh, processing with what's called uh, additive processing where you only place the uh, desired material when you want it to. Uh, you need to avoid the use of scarce materials or uh, processes that will slow down uh, the manufacturer. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, trying to keep the uh, embodied energy of uh, the solar cell as low as possible. Uh, and as the last thing is of course to try and take the device outside and uh, achieve uh, good lifetimes outside uh, and at the moment we are now talking years. This sacrifice in materials use of course also somehow is somehow reflected in the efficiencies of the soil cells uh, which is why if we look at larger scale uh, efficiency wise we're not talking above 10 percent but we are uh, for solution process solar cell, we are uh, more around 5% today. Uh, to make roll-to-roll -roll process solar cell, you of course need roll-to-roll -roll, uh, machinery. Uh, I will not go very much into detail about how this is done, but the uh, foil is let through the machine using edge guides, differing printing station, flexure printing, oven, slot die coating station, rotary screen printing, and the foil will, in the end, 
uh, be rolled up on the other side of the machine, meaning you have a roll on one side, will go through the machine and it will be collected in the other side. Uh, briefly about some of the processes that we use at DTU, flexible printing mentioned before is can be considered more or less like a continuous stamping where you continue to add ink to the stamp. Uh, rotary screen printing uh, is a tubing of a metal mesh where you put in a filler and when you put inside, inside this uh, tube you can squeeze out ink uh, in the areas where you have not put this filler directly onto the web. Finally we have slot decoding uh, where you pump the ink through a head and it will simply be deposited as the ink uh, moves by. Opposed to the two other technologies which are 2D where you can define a 2D pattern. Here uh, we're limited to coding stripes. Um, but for manufacture, um, what we did uh, or what we wanted was to look at the potential of the technology. Can we scale it to uh, a size where we would talk about solar parks? And for this we uh, started what we call the Infinity Project. Uh, where the aim was to fill uh, four times 100 meter long scaffolds, total of 10,000 square meters, uh, and try to operate these outside. The first step in this process was to try and develop an alternative to the ITO electrode uh, as the uh, transparent conducting electrode in the solar cell. We did this by uh, creating a a combination of a silver grid with a high conductive p dot and a layer of zinc oxide and this gave very very good conductivities uh, 20 ohm square as resistance of, of this foil. Of course uh, all of these uh, opposed to ITO was something that you could just simply print or code. Uh, such advantages of course seldom come without some sacrifice and this is uh, reflected in the, uh, in the uh, transmission spectrum of the, uh, the, the electrode where you see that it's somewhat, the flex uh, has a an, uh, transmitting somewhat lower than the ITO. And this is, if we look at the picture of the solar cell or the, the electrode, it's quite obvious uh, that you see that the silver grid, the silver fingers are blocking some of the, uh, the light, the incoming light. The next step was to try and deal with going to larger areas, how to deal with this uh, higher power in a very thin, flexible uh, substrate. Uh, our choice was to go for high voltage uh, in a series, serially connected module, uh, allowing uh, to, to have high voltage but avoiding uh, high current bus bars. Uh, everything had to be printed or coded in this and ideally have just two terminals, a plus and a minus. Uh, and this can be illustrated here as you see the connection going through the whole solar cell here. Just to see you how, show you how the uh, solar cell module was made, started out with flexure printing of uh, the front grid electrode covered by P.PSS and zinc oxide, as I explained before, for the flex strode. Then the active layer, in this case we use P3HT, uh, PCBM, a whole conducting P.PSS layer, and finally the silver uh, grid on the back side is what's connecting all the cells in series. And you see the pattern here, the fingers are going down and everything goes here, the fingers are going up. So everything goes in a loop like a snake like this. Here's a small video uh, showing the different processing steps uh, in the manufacture of the solar cell. First we have flexor printing of the front silver layer uh, followed by rotary screen printing. Here is what the ink is inside the screen and is pushed out through the mesh. Um, then we added zinc oxide by slot die coating and here you can see the small meniscus uh, for each stripe that is coded 
uh, and this keeping the alignment here is uh, done automatically. Uh, the same is done when we do the active layer, P3HT PCBM, uh, the active layer where the slot decoding head is kept precisely uh, positioned by using of pilot guidelines. Um, then finally, we are preparing for the, the back electrode. We have the whole conducting PWSS, uh, which is also applied by screen printing, uh, like the first layer, but is someone, uh, somewhat different uh, PDAT that can uh, resist the silver uh, that needs to be put on afterwards. Here you see the screen printing of the silver, and this is a silver uh, flake, so you need some robustness in the PDAT in order for not to create shorts through the device. Going to installation operation of these modules, uh, just to give you a, a, an overview of how big a scale we're talking about, a print run here would be roughly 700 meters of foil with a width of one foot. Uh, for each 100 meters, we would have uh, 21,000 serially connected cells, each being uh, seven square centimeters, uh, meaning that one 100 meter module would be just in the vicinity of 15 square meters. Uh, with P3HT PCBM, uh, the efficiency of such a module uh, was around 2% on day one. If you look at some of the other characteristics of uh, this module, you see voltages well above uh, 10,000 volts. Uh, and quite, it is quite well illustrated how the the uh, demand for 100% technical yield is achieved by the looking at the fill factor, which is for a 15 square meter uh, processed uh, solar cell or solar module, is still around 60%. Here you see the solar park as it was, as it was after it was installed, and how the wagon carrying the solar cell is placed, and the mounting of the uh, wiring at the end. Just to give you a little insight in how this is done, uh, the installation is, in our case, done, uh, you could say, manually using a wagon. Uh, but even with this, it's a, quite a fast uh, uh, mounting of the solar cell. Uh, as you can see here, the uh, limitation speed uh, for this is more or less uh, the, how fast can the senior scientist pushing the wagon go. It takes roughly one minute to mount 100 meters uh, of solar cell. Looking at the sca total scaffold with six parallel connected modules, each with 21,000 cells, uh, we were looking at an active area of, uh, in the vicinity of the 90 square meters, uh, and such a module could have an output around 1.3 kilowatt. Uh, Small reduction in efficiency was seen uh, to 1.5%, uh, but the system was quite stable outside. And uh, looking at the energy payback times for the system, uh, we estimated to be around 180 days for uh, this setup. After two years, it was taken down, but it was still, uh, the system was still running. As you might imagine, operating a solar cell system above 10 kilovolts involves uh, dangerous processes. Uh, it's not something that should be installed uh, by unknown personnel. Uh, and uh, we also had our share of failure, so to speak. Uh, lightning struck our uh, scaffold, uh, resulting in several burns in the foil. Uh, fortunately, we, after that, proved that the setup can be repaired. Simple scratches can be repaired simply by adding uh, extra barrier film. If there's a small defect, it can be cut out and uh, replaced by a wiring system, or you can actually put in a new piece of foil uh, in the middle. After the two years had gone, uh, we were, of course, also interested in looking at how can uh, how can we dismount this? If it's something that uh, has to be efficient, we need to be able to take it down quickly. 
it was quickly to put up, but uh, this of fortunately proved to be very easy. Uh, actually, it was even faster than uh, putting it up. We could do it at around 200 uh, meters a minute with our manual setup. One of the approaches that we wanted to try was to see, can we simply take the solar cell, shred it, and then extract the silver from these, these shredded materials afterwards. Uh, in order to do so, we, choose, we chose two different approaches. Where we, one where we simply took the solar cell as it was, dismount, directly dismounted from the scaffold, shredded it and did the extraction. On the other one, we, before shredding it, we removed the barrier foil, which is put on the backside of the, uh, the solar cell in order to protect it. Uh, towards the environment outside. This would allow, in theory at least, an easier access for the acid to go in and dissolve the silver. Six different experiments were conducted uh, in this leaching procedure. Three with non-delaminated uh, solar cells, meaning the foil shredded as it was on uh, the scaffold. And three where we delaminated the foil, removing the barrier uh, before shredding. In each experiment, uh, four feet uh, of solar cell was shredded and then treated with uh, nitric acid for 24 hours uh, in order to solve the silver. Uh, three different uh, concentrations were used. Concentrated nitric acid, meaning 14.2 molar, diluted to roughly one third, 4.7 molar, and one tenth, 1 1.4 molar. Uh, after the 24 hours, the solution was then uh, separated from uh, the solar cell foil and the silver was uh, precipitated as silver chloride and isolated in order to determine the extracting yield. Uh, we quite interestingly found that we could extract quite a lot of the silver, 90, 95% in both, both for the non-delaminated and the delaminated foils. Uh, and we also see that we can extract uh, silver for lower concentration but not to the same extent. Uh, one interesting thing is also that we see that with growing acid concentration, the acid consumption is in the process uh, increases dramatically. Uh, and uh, this uh, also results in when we look at the energy payback time for the systems that even if we have a 95% recovery, uh, the energy payback time will be reduced, but only with 8%. Uh, whereas the 72% uh, recovery will lead to a re reduction in energy payback time of 13%. The reason for this is best illustrated looking at the three piles of uh, um, non-delaminated foil. These were all the same size to begin with and then treated for 24 hours. And you see that the, the volume of the uh, foil treated, being treated with uh, concentrated nitric acid is much bigger than the one with diluted uh, nitric acid. And this is because the uh, solar cell foil will start to delaminate in the, uh, in the treatment with the acid, uh, resulting in, of course, a better extraction, but also attacking the foil itself. And this can be seen both as bleaching, delamination, and it's questionable whether the PET like this can be used afterwards. Uh, something we did not look into, uh, but will have to be uh, investigated further later on. One thing that we were interested in uh, was to try and reduce the acid uh, consumption in the uh, experiments um, and see if we could do this by incineration. Uh, the organic solar cell is comprised of roughly 99% of organic materials, uh, which is standard fuel, so to speak, in incineration plants. It's burned on an everyday ba basis. Um, and the question was then, can we recover the silver from the ash of such incinerated solar cells uh, by burning away uh, this protective matrix that is around the silver? Uh, the theory was that it would be easier accessible, accessible and the uh, extraction of silver would be uh, eased in this way. Um, again, we had three different experiments. 
uh, that was carried out, each comprised one square meters of organic solar cells that was uh, cut into smaller pieces. You can see here in the picture, uh, square meter rolled out on the ground and in the small bowl, you see where it's cut out uh, being prepared to, to be burned. Uh, in two of the experiments, we used what we call single encapsulation, which is what we typically had been using outside. But, uh, and this was conducted at 800 degrees and 1000 degrees. But in order to see if double lamination would have an effect, uh, we also include an experiment where the, the soil cell had been uh, protected by an extra lamination layer. After incineration of the solar cell, uh, 0.3 to 1 gram of ash was extracted uh, with either uh, 0 0.78 molar nitric acid or 1.42 molar nitric acid for two hours. Uh, this is the lowest concentration that we used in the... Uh, 1.42 was the lowest concentration used in the uh, shredding experiment and two hours is a reduction from 24 hours. After the two hours, a sample would be taken out from this uh, solution, uh, centrifuge and the silver content would be determined in the liquid, liquid phase by analyzing by ICPMS. Uh, the data clearly shows that the lowest of the concentration, 0.78 molar nitric acid, is not enough to have a significant extraction of, of silver, but at 1.42 we see that at 800 degrees uh, incineration temperature, we can actually extract uh, more or less quantitatively the silver uh, used for the preparation of the solar cell. Uh, it's quite remarkable to see though that if we go to higher temperatures, the extraction extent is not as good, uh, both for the single encapsulation and for the double encapsulation. Um, and some might think that this could be due to uh, uh, to volatilization of the silver somehow, fly ash, but this is not the case. Uh, this was determined by micro XRF. One possible explanation could be uh, the formation of solids uh, where the silver is not uh, so accessible, meaning that the extraction of the silver will be, uh, be more hindered. Um, if we're to compare the methods, uh, the acid consumption is 100 to 150 times lower when we extract on the ash compared to the uh, shredded solar cells. Also, the reaction times are lowered from 24 hours to two hours. Uh, it's possible to do the extraction with diluted acid which from, uh, the, for the people working with the extraction is quite a safety issue. Uh, and also life cycle analysis show that uh, if you use the ash extraction method, you generally have 20% lower impact on the environment uh, using the ash extraction compared to the uh, shredded cells. So overall, you could say that both methods uh, can justify uh, the use of silver in, in organic solar cells if proper recycle programs uh, are used, uh, but extraction from the ash is definitely more uh, energy efficient. To sum it up, we have shown that uh, organic solar cells can be scaled up to an extent where we can store them in solar parks. Uh, they can uh, produce power outside for serious time, two years. They're easily uh, dismounted and afterwards it's possible to reuse and uh, recycle some uh, of the materials used in, in the process. Uh, and with this I would like to thank you for listening.